Hello and welcome back. I hope that everybody is doing well. I hope that you are staying healthy. From the sounds of it, most of us are getting our butts kicked by this new Omicron variant. So if you're not familiar with the new NP's Facebook group page, then it's a really great way for you to interact with fellow nurse practitioners, new nurse practitioners, uh, nurse practitioner students. And I always link it in the description box below. And so, you know, if you're on Facebook, you should definitely check it out. That being said, yesterday, I had done a check-in with all of the group members and I requested that people share how COVID is going, where they are at, and to include their location. And so far, the majority of the responses are very similar, and that is that there is an increasing number of COVID patients and dwindling staff. I can tell you that in the urgent care that I'm working at currently, we are definitely getting slammed with a lot of COVID positive patients. Of course, you know, it's a good sign that they're in the outpatient setting and not in the emergency room. However, uh, that being said, I have a lot of friends still in the hospital and in the ERs, and they are also seeing a large influx of COVID positive patients. The Omicron variant truly seems to be spreading like wildfire. And even those who are vaccinated are getting symptomatic COVID. However, the vaccine does seem to still be doing a good job of reducing the risk for severe disease. And for that, I am very thankful. So on November 19th, 2021, Omicron was first identified in Botswana. And by late December, still obviously 2021, Omicron accounted for the majority of new COVID infections in the U.S., Many hope that we are on track for this to turn into an endemic, which is a disease or condition that is commonly found in a population such as influenza or flu. And unfortunately, though, much of the literature still says that it's too early to say just yet if this is the path that Omicron is taking us on. However, this could be our best case scenario. So here is hoping fingers crossed. <laughs> I included this direct quote here at the bottom of the slide, and this is from Up to Date, and it describes how Omicron, though seemingly more mild, may be more detrimental than it's being credited for. And so I'll just read that for you really quick. I thought this was interesting. It says the relative mildness of disease in these studies may reflect the younger age of individuals impacted at this stage of the surge or a higher proportion of reinfections. Nevertheless, these and other emerging reports suggest that Omicron is associated with milder illness. However, even if the individual risk for severe disease with Omicron is lower than with prior variants, the high number of associated cases can still result in high rates of hospitalizations and excess burden on the healthcare system. So one major concern that I have is still that how many unvaccinated people we have. Currently, 62.3% of the U.S.'s population is fully vaccinated, and specifically where I'm at, only 57% of Michigan's population is fully vaccinated against COVID. Another big concern I have is for that dwindling number of healthcare staff, as mentioned multiple times. Um, that's not obviously what today's discussion is about, but I wanted to point out that this continues to play a huge role in these suffering hospital systems. So today I wanted to talk about the new antiviral agents that have been given emergency authorization use for the treatment of adult patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 and risk factors for worsening disease. As a reminder, risk factors for worsening disease with COVID includes, but is not limited to, of course, cancer, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, chronic liver disease, diabetes, cardiac disease, obesity, pregnancy, sickle cell smoking, and immunosuppression. So I know for me, these drugs are going to become a large part of my practice as we do see so many COVID positive patients in our office every day. And though the monoclonal antibodies have been a wonderful tool tool uh, for treating COVID patients with an increased risk for worsening disease, only one of the three monoclonals that are available right now have been shown to be effective against this new widely spread Omicron variant, and that's the monoclonal antibody called sotrovimab. So, however, now we have these two additional tools to use against COVID, 
And these are the oral antiviral medications similar to something like a Tamiflu or Oseltamivir, which we give for, of course, influenza. So now we have something, and Jesus, bear with me if I can pronounce these, but there is Nermatrolvir and Ritonavir, and those are given in a combination. It's also known as Paxlovid, and then Molnupiravir. So up to date actually lists Molnupiravir as an alternative for treatment of COVID that should only be used if the options of Sotrovimab or Paxlo Paxlovid or Regeneron even are unavailable. All right, so first up, let's talk about Paxlovid. So this slide, it does have a lot of information on it, but I tried to consolidate uh, what everything that you need to know when prescribing Paxlovid. So as shown, Paxlovid is a combination of two drugs, Nermatrolivir and Ritonavir. So Nermatrolivir, it blocks the activity of a SARS-CoV-2 enzyme that is required for vi uh, viral replication to occur. And then Ritonavir, this slows the metabolism of Nermatrolivir so it can remain active for a longer time. Paxlovid, it should be initiated as soon as possible following a COVID diagnosis and within five days of symptom onset. And that's for patients 12 years and older and weighing at least 40 kilograms. The dose is 300 milligrams by mouth of the Nermatrolvir with 100 milligrams PO of Ritonavir and it's taken twice a day together for five days. And then patients with reduced kidney function, so a GFR of 30 or greater, the Nermatrolvir is cut in half and it's 150 milligrams POBID plus the 100 milligrams of ritonavir. For patients with a GFR less than 30 or with severe liver impairment, Paxlovid is not recommended for use. Another important consideration with Paxlovid is that this drug is a CYP3A inhibitor. If you remember back to pharmacology, this is also referred to as the cytochrome P450 system, and it's largely responsible for drug metabolism. Therefore, the fact that Paxlovid inhibits this system is especially concerning if the patient is also on medications that, if not cleared appropriately, are going to be dangerous to them at high levels. So examples of medications that you want to be on the lookout for and thus avoid administering uh, Paxlovid in conjunction with include, and I listed the drugs for you here, but some common ones, of course, like amiodarone, colchicine, uh, cl uh, clozapine, simvastatin, some common ones to keep an eye out for. Additionally, this drug should not be given with CYP3 inducers. And examples of these include carbamazepine, phenobarbital, uh, phenytoin, and there's some other ones there, St. John's wort. So finally, there is limited information too available in regards to Paxlovid and pregnant and or lactating patients. So these patients, they were excluded from clinical studies and data collection is still continuing to grow on these populations. That being said, ritonavir, it does pass into breast milk and there have been some embryo fetal development adverse events that have been observed following exposure to the nermatrolvir. However, as always in medicine, of course, we must make these calculated risks and we have to weigh those benefits with those risks. We know that pregnancy is a large risk factor for severe and worsening COVID and therefore Paxlovid should be considered and administered in pre uh, pregnant patients if the benefits outweigh the risk. This will of course require clinical decision making on your part. However, it's just important to know that use of this drug should be considered with COVID positive pregnant patients with mild to moderate symptoms and especially those who have one or more of those risk factors we previously listed. So molnupiravir is another antiviral agent that was given emergency authorization use for the treatment of mild to moderately symptomatic COVID-19 patients. However, this time it's for those patients 18 years and older, still as soon as possible following a COVID diagnosis and within five days of symptom onset. As I mentioned previously, UpToDate states that molnupiravir should be used if Paxlovid, Sotrovimab, or Regeneron are unavailable. Of course, there are advantages to Paxlovid and molnupiravir, and that's that they're taken orally, um, as, of course, both Sotrovimab and Regeneron require IV access and, of course, monitoring. 
So, however, though, molnupiravir has shown to be not as effective as these other options listed, and there are some additional safety concerns with this drug. So, the dose for molnupiravir is 800 milligrams BID for five days. There is no dose adjustment needed to be made based on kidney or liver function, and there's also no medication contraindications. However, as I already said, Molnupiravir is contraindicated in patients less than 18 years old, and this is actually due to an increased risk for bone and cartilage toxicity. And this is compared to Paxlovid, which of course can be prescribed in patients 12 years and older. Additionally, molnupiravir is contraindicated in pregnant and lactating patients. And because of this, a pregnancy test should be done before prescribing molnupiravir. Even more, Female patients should be instructed to use reliable contraception during treatment and then four days following the completion of treatment. And for male patients, I thought this was kind of a large number, they should be instructed to use reliable contraceptive during treatment for at least three months following completing the molnupiravir therapy treatment. So of course the demand for these antivirals are extremely high right now and therefore there may be specific requirements local to you based on your state of res residence and then of course the current availability of the medications. So Michigan provided uh, prescribers with priority eligibility criteria when determining who would most benefit from the available treatments. I included the criteria here for Michigan um, and I encourage you to stay current with whatever is available to you in your state and your practice um, because it, it can vary. All right, and I think on that note, that's going to be it for today. What do you guys think? Are you excited to have these antiviral agents as an option for treating COVID patients? I know that I am. These treatment options, they have shown to greatly reduce hospitalization rates, and they'll hopefully help us transition into the endemic phase of this giant nightmare that we are currently living. Who knew healthcare during a pandemic would be so exhausting? <laughs> But yeah, that's it. Don't forget to support the channel by subscribing, liking, all the other clicks that YouTube wants you to do. I always appreciate the support from you guys. And until next time, don't forget to learn something new every day. And I will talk with you again soon.